all the things that the enemy did for evil towards me, God gave it back. And he doubled it. And he told me, you're going to spread this message of forgiveness. Welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. I'm Julie, your host. I have something absolutely amazing for you today. I am thrilled and honored to share my guest with you. His name is Dr. and Pastor Tony Davis out of Southern California. Tony is a gospel recording artist and inspirational speaker, author, and film producer. He's passionate about serving others. He loves the Lord. He had something crazy happen to him. It was in 2003, the end of June. He was actually selected randomly as part of a gang initiation to be murdered by a gang. And he was shot five times. And one of them hit his femoral artery. He actually died on the scene. He was dead for 30 minutes. He was pronounced. That part is not in the movie, but they actually go to cover him with a sheet. Tony will tell the story. But in this testimony, there are many miracles there. Obviously, his survival is completely a miracle. His healing that he experienced, two major things from the incident that were, he will share that healing miracle with you. There is a piece of deliverance. There's an angel story. And I love this man's heart and what, how he's serving and what God has done through this man with his obedience. It's truly amazing. So you're going to be blessed today. And on the big uh, resume of all of his shows, he actually has a global internet broadcasting show called Everyday Miracles. <laughs> so we had a little chuckle about that. So I feel he's a kindred spirit. So just thrilled to have him. I hope you enjoy today. Thanks for listening. So Tony, Pastor Tony, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm just honored to have you on my show. Thank you, Sister Julia. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm great to be here. I left my job on, uh, it was a beautiful day. Um, uh, I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday that in, in the week. I can't remember. It was back in 2003. I had left my job and um, I was on my way to pick up my wife from work. We both worked at boarding care facility. We worked with special needs clients. And so we loved our jobs and we were doing great. And I was on my way to pick her up from work. And unfortunately, I didn't know that the devil had plotted something really bad for me by influencing these young people, these young guys over at this home, pretty much across the, the street from where she worked at a, a boarded up house. Uh, these guys hang, you know, was hanging out, you know, and we see that all the time in LA, you know, so it's nothing unusual that you see little things here and there. And so I, I, you know, I thought everything was totally fine, you know, no issues there, never had any issues with anyone in the neighborhood. So I thought everything would be, be, be fine. So I was on my way to pick her up from work. And like I said, these young gang members, they attacked me. First, they shot up my Jeep. So I got out of there real quick. Thank goodness Chris had not came out of that home because usually when I pull up for her to, you know, to pick her up, she comes straight out and gets in, the, in my Jeep and we leave to go home. And I do that every night, uh, Monday through Friday. So it was, it, it was a, you know, a, a regular routine that we did. So, um, but that particular time when I pulled up there, gunfire just starts ringing out. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm in the middle of somebody shooting at somebody else, you know, something crazy going on over here today. And so I heard the bullets hit my Jeep and I pulled off real fast and I went around the corner and I made another right turn and I had to pull over to the side because uh, one of the bullets had hit my, well, actually a few of the bullets, about two or three bullets hit the radiator. So steam from the radiator had fogged up my window. So I had no other choice but to pull over and stop right there on the side of the road. And I was like, oh my God, um, what happened? And then I got out the car and I thought about Chris. Please, I hope she didn't come out that house. So I I wasn't shot at that point, just my Jeep, right? My back, was it left tire was on flat or was it right tire? One of them was on flat, right? So, um, and on top of that, yeah, on top of that, I had two kids on the back seat. I, I forgot to mention that. There was two kids on the back seat along with a girl that released her and her boyfriend. And what happened was on my way to pick her up that particular day, 
her relief person, they, her car had broke down on her like two blocks over from where the facility was. So on my way to pick up Chris, I had this week, you know, I had to drive over there, pick them up and bring them all over to the home. And thank goodness, um, when I remember looking at the back seat at the kids and they were just, the eyes were like buck because it was one of the kids were about five, I think. The other one was about seven. But thank God no bullet hit, came inside to actually hit us individually, you know? Um, and so I, 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 you know, they, they took the kids and, and they made a call to, to get out of there, right? So I ran back over to the house to check on Chris. And I got over there and um, Chris said, I heard the gunshots. I, I'm like, she said, oh my God, I couldn't believe that was happening over here. I said, me neither. I said, you know what? This is it. You will not be coming back over here anymore. I'm sorry. This is it right here. And the police had pulled up, you know, because she had called the police and and uh, <clears throat> I explained what had happened about my Jeep and all that. <clears throat> they said, well, let, let's go over there and take a look. So like, they went over to the to the place where my Jeep was. And lo and behold, they, they saw a bullet hole in my left door. And the police said a nine millimeter did that. I'm like, oh my God, nine millimeter. And then he saw the, the back tire on flat and he said, you know what? We've been having issues in this area where gang members are killing people init to initiate to be a part of a gang. They're killing people. Uh, we had two incidents about three weeks ago, a few blocks from here. We got an idea of the gang that's doing this type of activity. We're going to go into an investigation. And I'm like, okay, call AAA. They called AAA truck for me. And the mistake was they left me there. They said, well, look, we, we called another unit. The, the unit is on its way. So you should be okay. I said, yeah, I hope so. I'm looking around. I hope so. You know, I, okay. And they left me there. And when they left me there, a few moments later, I couldn't believe what happened. A few moments later, about 15 minutes later, I looked up and I saw the AAA truck coming down the road. And I began to wave by right here, right here. All of a sudden, as I was walking in the middle of the street trying to tr flag down the AAA truck, bullets started to ring out from behind me. And um, I, the bullets, some of the bullets, I heard them go across my ear, right? And just, it was like, just, just go by my ear and begin to hit the front of the truck. And the guy, he threw his truck in reverse and he backed into some parked cars and he got out of there, right? So I turned to run. And when I turned to run, trying to get out of the way of this, this gunfire that was passing me by, when I turned to run, the first bullet hit my left leg and two more bullets followed. And I felt that pain. And I ran limping towards my Jeep, trying to get out, out of the way of wherever the bullets were coming from because it was nighttime and I didn't know exactly where it was coming from. So I ran and I fell down in, by my tire. And I said to myself, wait a minute, I know I did not just get shot. And I, and I began to feel this wetness to my pants legs. And the blood would just begin to drench my, my pants leg and um all of a sudden it just got everywhere it was all in my chest all in my face um because i'm touching it you know couldn't believe i had just got shot oh and when i thought the nightmare was over another young man came from the front side of the jeep <clears throat> and he began to shoot me all over again it was horrible um he shot me in my right side area. Then another bullet came and hit the ground and came up through my calf and my right leg. And bullets went across my face and my chest. He was just shooting. Couldn't believe it. And all of a sudden, I, something inside of me said, stand up and face your enemy. And I stood up and there was this young kid Looked like a little nephew, a black kid. He had this gun pointed towards my head. And I said, why? What have I done to make you shoot me like this? You don't even know my name. Who are you? And then all of a sudden, since Julie, I said, it's amazing 
how, and I think it's so important to really, really get to know God, to really get to know Jesus, and to embed to a, and just hold on to the Word of God. You know, to just sink it, sink it down into your spirit, man, your spirit woman. Just begin to absorb that word so that when the foes of the enemy comes up, you're able to speak life or speak against what the enemy is doing. That's what I remember as I think back on that moment. Out of nowhere, I said, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to shoot me anymore. That came out of nowhere. And I know that was because of me studying the word of God, absorbing the word of God, and had it down in my spirit, you know, where my spirit can speak up, when my flesh cannot. That's what I felt. And so when I said that his hand trembled and I saw the blackness in his guy, I could tell that he was possessed by the enemy. But when I said in the name of Jesus, see the Bible said there's power in that name. When I said Jesus, I seen the darkness in his eyes clear up. And he had that quick moment to think about what he was doing to an innocent person. And he trembled and he lowered the gun. And that young man fell behind, he, he dropped down behind the tree and I heard him saying things like, you know, my God, what have I done? So I walked as far as I could towards some light. I was trying to get out of that dark area where my, where my Jeep was towards some light. I walked as far as I could and I fell down in the road, the middle of the road. And in that moment, uh, the enemy started mocking me. I heard legions of demons laughing. You've been praising that God. Look what that God allowed me to do to you. I felt so hurt. It makes you feel like God abandoned me at that moment. You know, you remind me of, of when Jesus was on the cross and he said, why have thou forsaken me? I just felt like that. I just felt that like God had left me. But in that moment, I still trusted God. I trusted him beyond what I felt, what it looked like, what had happened to me. I said, I got to trust him because I have nothing else to trust but him. And to hold to my Jesus. And I trusted God, right? And so I lift my hands and I begin to worship him. And I thought about Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet still would I trust him. I remember that, that word in the Bible. So I, I lift my hand. See, it's easy to praise God when things are great and dandy, but when you're in your low, I call it the lullaby time. When you're in that desolate place, when you feel like the enemy is one over your life or over the situations, you have to learn to press in and praise God. Say, God, I trust you beyond this. You're bigger. One of my favorite quotes, I always say, God, you're bigger than this. You're greater than this, God. When I'm going through something horrific in my life, whether it's a death of a loved one or something horrible that happened, God, you're bigger than this. And so I just trusted God beyond me, beyond my pain. And I just worshiped. And I felt my heart slowing down. Blood was everywhere. I was in a pool of blood at that point. I, I remember picking the phone up and calling Chris, my cell phone. I said, Chris, they shot me. And I heard a scream. And I dropped the phone. And I just lifted my hand back up. Hmm. Just begin to worship God. God, I love you. Just take care of my family because I knew I was going to die. It was too much blood. I said, just take care of my family. Take care of Chris. Take care of my mother, my sisters. Just take care of my, those, my, my friends. I begin to just pray for everybody, you know. And um, and uh, so in that, um, I remember my heart stopped. I felt the last voodoo. My heart beat and my hands dropped to the ground. And when my hand dropped to the ground, and I died. And I remember, I had this out-of-body experience. I remember seeing, all of a sudden, a lady came out of nowhere. And she came and 
She had on all white. Her hair was black and gray. It was like, I know her from somewhere, even though I didn't know her, but I believe that she was my garden angel. That's who I believe she was. She picked my head up. She placed it in her lap. And she looked up and she said, my God, what have they done? She looked back at me and she said, it's going to be all right. And she rubbed my head one time. And she rubbed it again. I'm saying to myself, she's going to get her dress all bloody, right? Because blood was just everywhere. And I'm thinking about, you know. She rubbed it again. And the third time, I felt something come out of my body, like my soul just lifted up out of the body. And I began to float up towards these clouds. But to my right, I saw the body laying on the ground in the right corner of my eye as I floated. And I'm telling you, Sister Julia, I floated towards these clouds. The closer I got to these clouds, I felt, I began to feel this lift of sorrow, of my pain, of my shame, of my why me began to just dissipate. It began to just come away from me. And I got to these clouds and I stopped in midair in this window, this huge window opened and, and down through those clouds, down in there, I saw this huge, beautiful city. I saw colors. I've never seen those colors on earth before. Beautiful, bright, radiant colors. And I saw these sparkles of light floating through the city. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit man. And it said to me, those are archangels. They never stop praising God. I'm telling you, I feel so good. I feel so free. I felt so loved. All of my cares about my family, my friends, my, my Chris, my mother, my sisters, it went away from me and I was consumed with love and I felt like, Tony, they're going to be all right. They're going to be all right. And I heard these people talking. They had so much joy. They felt like they, it was just so beautiful. To my left side, I felt a lot of joy. To my right, it was like just a lot of peace and almost like I heard a waterfall. And down the middle, I saw this, this, this glow, like a yellowish golden glow coming from the bottom. I couldn't see what it was down there, but it was a glow, like a golden glow. And all of a sudden, God's, these clouds came around me. It was the Shekinah glory of God came around me and he held me right there. Mm, I felt so good. I'm telling you. Oh, I just felt like, you know, I felt like everybody's supposed to be there. I don't care what color you are, blue, green, purple, just pick your color. Who cares? Heaven doesn't, heaven doesn't care about, about that. I just felt like everybody's supposed to be there. And I tried to push my way inside. Inside. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me. It's amazing because God doesn't speak to our flesh. He speaks to our spirit. Our spirit man, our spirit woman. And he spoke to me. He didn't speak to my ears. He spoke to my spirit. He said, Tony, it's not yet your time. Go back. And I'm like, no, 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 no way. I, I'm not going back to that. It's just no way. I'm staying right here. I, because I felt like everybody belongs there. I felt like it was the place that Jesus said I'm going to prepare. When I think about back on it, I, it just, it felt so beautiful. It felt so good. I mean, all around me was just love. I mean, it was just pure love. No agendas, no hidden agendas, no manipulation, no craziness, just love, pure love. And I wanted to stay right there, right there forever. And uh, it just hurt my heart to think about coming back. And, um, and, and um, all of a sudden, God said, Tony, there's a message I need you to deliver to my people. I said, I don't want to, God, please. I don't want to stay. And the third time, third time he said my name again, Tony, your work is not yet done. Go back. And I heard this blow like a wind, like wind blowing. And I began to go backwards. My hands were going through clouds. I was trying to grab something. And all of a sudden I breathed. When I breathed, I had this life support, this tube extended from this hole in my throat. 
And the doctor was about to put the shit over my head. But when I breathed, he, he, I screamed, ah, and he dropped the sheet and he ran out the room. I scared that polar man to death. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you had been pronounced, you were dead for 30 minutes. 30 minutes is what I was told. Mm. And they told me I would have brain damage. Uh, they told me that I wouldn't be able to talk anymore. Um, uh, one of the bullets hit my femoral artery in my left leg, so they was going to amputate my left leg. It was just a whole lot of bad news, you know. And uh, they placed me in the amputation room to cut off the leg. But I, I let me let you interject because I've just been sharing all that. In, anything? Um, no, you're doing amazing. I just wanted to make sure that was clear that you were, they were putting a sheet over your head. You've been pronounced dead. 30 yes. minutes, it's, it's scientifically impossible. You know, with any anesthesia, it was like four minutes without oxygen and your, your brain starts to die. So this is an outright miracle. <laughs> just want to be clear, but I want you to yeah. keep going because you were talking about the message Jesus gave you, but I just wanted to get that in there. So you're doing great. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, I feel so sad coming back here. I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, it just, when I think about it, here we are in 20, 2020 and I still feel sad sometimes when I think about coming back to this world, because when you, um, experience so much love and peace and joy unspeakable, and, and all the freedom of just, you know, love by everything that's there. Everything is love and everything is peace and joy. And I mean, nothing is out of place. It just felt like, you know, everybody loved each other. Everybody greeted each other with, 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 beauty, with beauty and love. I just felt that all through that place. And I wanted to stay there. But it, like I said, it, God said, he sent me back with this message. So they pushed me in this room called an amputation room because the doctor told me they had put a plastic stent in my leg, is what he told me. But he said it wasn't sitting right. And so the leg had died. And so they would have to cut off the left leg. And also he explained to me that when I died, they couldn't get the tube through my mouth. So they had to do emergency trach. So they cut my throat and he mistakenly cut a piece of my vocal cord. <laughs> the doctors did that part. <laughs> like you were telling me about what happened. <laughs> you were the situation. The doctors did that part, right? They cut a piece of my vocal cord. I, I mean, just one bad thing. Now I'm already dead. And here these guys go cut my throat up, you know? <laughs> like, oh my God, here we go. So they cut the piece of the vocal cord. So they told me, but well, don't worry, don't worry. We could put a, a hole there on the side of your throat and you'll be able to speak through a microphone. And I'm like... I'm saying to myself, are you kidding me? You know, I'm, I'm a, I am a gospel singer. And, and it's funny because my wife told the doctors when they told her, they came out and told her, well, look, we have some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? And Chris said, give me the bad news. And she said, he told her that we're so sorry. We, we lost him. He died. And she said she fell down screaming, crying. And he said, wait, wait, wait. But, but he came back. Because I, I didn't believe, honestly, I couldn't believe my own story. I said, this is just impossible. I, I, it's unreal. I don't believe this happened. It just, I just couldn't believe it. But what God did for me was, even though he healed me, um, I have the scars to show how real it was. My left leg, this long, ugly cut. You know, when I look at my leg and the cuts are there. And I'm like, Tony, it happened for real. That's for sure. You know, you got a reminder on that one. But um, in that, they put me in an amputation room, long story short, and they was going to amputate the leg. And um, and it was going to prep me for this box on the side of my throat to speak through this microphone. And, um, hmm. oh, Lord. So I was in that room, and I remember I was like the, the third what was the third person to, to get an a, a amputation. They had cut this guy's leg off that was on the other side of the curtain from me. And they came back to cut some more of his leg off because they had to, it wasn't, they didn't cut enough. I'm like, oh my God. And I found myself praying for that man. I took the cares off of me and I just began to pray for him. I said, Lord, give him peace. 
put a blanket of love on him. Let him know that you love him. I just prayed for him because he was, oh, he was crying and grabbed towards his leg and all that blood. I was like, God, this is horrible. And um, so in that, I, um, huh, I laid back after I did all the praying and, and I just, I was, I was just going to accept what was to be. And all of a sudden, 12 o'clock midnight, I remember looking at around the room, 12 o'clock midnight. There was a change in my room. There was a visitation in my room. The Holy Spirit came in that room. God visited me. And he said one word to me. Forgive. Oh, my God. That right there, forgive, is one of the most difficult things that a human being can do because of our flesh, because of our hurt, our pain, because of what the enemy sets up inside of our heart from what has happened to us. Because I know some people say, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what I went through. You don't know. But what I think about, well, guess what? They killed me. I died. And I, if I found the strength to forgive, I'm sure you can too. And I always share that with people when I share my testimony and different speaking engagements. But anyway, getting back to that point. So um, God said that word forgive. I wrestled with that thing. I had this tube in my throat. Blood was coming from around the tube. And I'm like, no, God, God, look what they did to me, God. Look what they did. I didn't bother. I never held a gun. I never shot anybody. I never did. I never thought of this. And look what happened to me. And yeah, it's, it was so funny getting back to my wife too. Um, Cause I came from singing R and B, you know, and I just switched over to gospel like in 95, total, went total, total gospel, just sold out for Christ. So Chris told the doctors when they told her that I wasn't going to be talking anymore, possibly, but you know, but through a, through a microphone, she said, well, you might as well just kill him because he loved to sing. I said, wait, 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 you, you told him what? I'm not that crazy about singing, girl. Why would you tell me? <laughs> that was funny, you know. You might want to kill him. I'm like, what? You might as well kill him. I'm not that crazy about singing. I couldn't believe she said that. But anyway, that was, that's what she said. Anyway, getting back to that point. So in that, um, I, I wrestled with forgiveness, right? And I began to think about forgiveness. I began to, like, dissect it. Well, how, why should I? How can I? In what way? And as I looked at forgiveness, I said, you know what? Forgiveness is not what I feel. It's not a feeling because you're not going to feel like forgiving someone that has done you wrong. But if you can go be on the other side of that, if you can go beyond that, if you can look at a bigger picture of that, you can forgive. Something far more greater because it, it's releasing you from the pain of what that situation or that thing has caused in your life and I said God forgiveness is not a feeling it's a choice so I am going to forgive for what they did to me I forgive and that's what made me come up with the, the title of my film when Tony said I forgive you know and I so I forgave and it was like I pushed it away from me you have to let it go and let God, as they say. It was like God opened his hand to me and said, give it to me. So I pushed it out of my heart, my, the pain of it all. I said, God, I give it to you. All of my hurt, I give it to you, God. And it was like he just took it in his hands and just pulled, pulled it away and just demolished it out of my heart. That's what I felt. And I felt so free. I felt so good. I felt lighter. I felt like God is going to take care of my enemies. I felt like it's going to be all right. So I let it go and I let God. And when I did that, I'm telling you this is the truth. I, the room got extra warm. There's something touched my leg and I, on my feet. It went up into the artery area and I felt like stuff was being mingled together in my leg. It was, I know that was Jesus. I know that was the healing power of Jesus. I know what it was. It went up to my throat and I felt stuff being mingled together in my throat, and I said, and I just lift my hand, I said, Jesus, you said you would never leave me or forsake me. You said that in your word, and I trusted your word beyond my pain, and you came here to touch me, God. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, just like the woman, she said, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, 
if I could just touch you, God, and I felt like I touched him, and he answered by healing me. That's what I felt. And um, I felt so good. So I laid back and went into this deep sleep. I felt so good. The next morning, I remember a few hours later, I felt something rub the bottom of my feet, the, the bad leg that it was about to amputate, right? I felt something, and I jumped the leg, and I opened my eyes. There was about seven, eight doctors around me, and this one doctor was training these other doctors on doing amputations. So they had been, they had marked my leg above the knee, and they was preparing to cut the leg off. When I jumped my leg, they were like, whoa! They jumped back, and they were like, wait, wait, wait. And they began to grab the leg, and they were twisting and like, this can't be, wait, 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 did you just see that? Mr. Davis, can you wiggle your toes? I'm like, and I wiggle the toes. They were like, whoa! They could not believe it, and they so, um, they rushed me to x-ray, and and they said, we don't know what's going on, but there's life in that leg. And we, we don't understand this. And they pushed me in this other room. I remember about the third day. I can't remember all the, but the details of it all. But I remember they put me in that room and they said, Mr. Davis, they called me the miracle man. I would have this one nurse every night before she'd get off. She would come to that room and just look in there at me and shake her head. She couldn't believe it. i would never get that. She could not believe it. She, they used to call me the miracle man on that floor. So anyway, um, um, the doctor, I remember he came in the room and said, Mr. Davis, this is the third day. We don't want to go beyond this because we, if so, we got to do a permanent trade. I don't know why he said that after the third day, we have to do this. Um, um, but if you could just say something, because we've seen your leg is working. If you could just say something, we won't have to do this thing. So... What they did was the doctor, when he, when he went and got the other doctor, and the doctor came in and said, Mr. Davis, we, we've seen, I've seen some miracles with you. If you could just say one word, take a deep breath and, and concentrate on pushing air up. Concentrate on bringing it forth. You, you're a believer, right? I see. Nod in my head. Yes. He said, just concentrate on pushing it up, you know, and take a deep breath. And, he, and I took a deep breath, and he pulled that thing off, and I said, Jesus, my healer, Jesus, my deliverer. And he took a needle and thread. And the other guy was like, I can't believe this. I, I didn't know that. He said, look, just give me the needle and thread. And he took a needle and thread. He sewed that hole up and, and put some whatever, that glue stuff, whatever there. And I've been talking. My voice came back better. I came back whole. My leg is alive. I can jump on this leg. I can run on this leg. All the things that the enemy did for evil towards me, God gave it back. And he doubled it. And he told me, you're going to spread this message of forgiveness. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? And and I'm telling you, this is the truth. I know God is in this. This is the God of the truth. i never forget, I was in Georgia with my wife. We was, we'd take our daily walks uh, in this beautiful park in Marietta. Um, and so we was walking and, and, and I'm like, I was, God spoke to me. He said, Tony, I want you to share my message around the world. And I'm like, around the world? How am I going to do that? I don't have any platforms. All I do is do my little singing. How am I well, going to do that? And he said, do you trust me? I said, of course I trust you. I'm saying that to myself because I'm walking with Chris and I didn't, you know, I'm saying it to my to my spirit. Of course I trust you. This far? And um, all of a sudden my phone rung and I looked at my phone and I'm like, who is this? And I Oh, and I picked the phone up and I, you know, I said, hello, I answered the phone and it was TBN. It was, um, it was uh, Jan's secretary. She was telling me Jan was on the other line because she please talk to me. She saw me, uh, my story on the 700 Club and is it any way possible I could be on TBN? And I'm like, okay, yeah. So she put on the line. Oh my goodness, she was crying and saying how much it touched her and would I please? I said, of course. So it's amazing. God opened up the doors. I got on those platforms and went forth. And I've done so many others since that time. And all of a sudden, God opened up the door. Um, God told me to begin to speak into the atmosphere about doing a movie. I said, doing a movie? How can I do that? I never did a movie before. And he said, speak it. Speak those things as though they are. That's in his word. So I began to share with people. God said, I'm going to do a movie. God said, they were like, Tony, you don't have money to do a movie. It's a lot of money costs a lot of money and i said but god said it he owns the cattle on a thousand hills right that's what we're supposed, supposed to believe i said god said it how 
So I began to speak it and tell people I shared on TBN. And God touched a guy way over there in Boston. Unbelievable. He had that man to call me and tell me that God told him to do this. He said, I don't trust you as a man, you know, as an earthly man, but I trust a God in you. True story. And we went forth, and that's how you saw the movie, I Forgive. Amen, amen. And it was amazing. I enjoyed it so much. And I know there's more coming. So can you share it? There's also another piece I want you to share about you felt led to go back to the scene. If you could share that piece, it's really amazing. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So amazing. You know, um, after I got out the hospital, I went back. This is true. I went back several times. I took flowers trying to meet the, the older gentleman that I scared to death. Just ask him, was it true? Was, and they said, Mr. David, this is confidential. He, he does not want to have anything to do with you. He said it was weird what happened to that guy. <laughs> he didn't even want to see me anymore. He said, they said, you scared the living lights out that guy. He, he just, he's an older guy and he just, he wouldn't even see me no more. I'm like, well, could I leave these flowers? For yeah, you could do that. And Chris went with me, my wife, and we were like, wow. I mean, I just wanted to ask them questions. I just wanted to make sure what my experience was. And they they couldn't give me my answers. And, you know, I tried all kinds of ways. Even I remember Dr. Oz, them, they tried, you know, they, but anyway, they were just weird. So anyway, after that, I remember I waited a few months. And when I felt better, about three months, when I was doing pretty good, I remember I said, I'm going to go back over there to save them guys' life. I'm going to save their souls. I'm going to change them through the blood of Jesus, through forgiveness, like what God sent me back to do. And I didn't tell Chris. I called myself going to go over there. Just So I went over there. I, I know the movie is a little different because, you know, Hollywood takes your movie based on and they do little things. They did the best they could. So, okay. I had to accept what they did. So anyway, I went back over there and there was this yellow tape around the house. And I'm looking around like, what happened here? And I'm like, man, I had my Bible in my hand. I just knew I was going to share the word of God. And all of a sudden, um, I'm like, what happened? Uh, this guy came out of nowhere. He, he was pushing a cart. He was limping. And he was like a homeless guy. He had a cart full of stuff. And, and he said, those are your people? I'm like, who is this guy? And I said, no. He said, it's a doggone shame. They was shooting other people and other gangs and another gang retaliated, came over here and shot and killed all those guys that was on this porch. I said, really? Oh, man, I came to forgive. What could have, oh, my God, why? And all of a sudden this guy said, the forgiveness was for you. The forgiveness was for you. And I looked around and he was gone. Do you hear me? He had disappeared. I said, wait, 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 wait. I know I'm not crazy. So I ran around the corner looking for the guy. He was no, no way he could have got away that fast pushing a basket. He was limping like he had a bad feet or something. And I'm like, there's no way this guy could have went around this block that fast. I went around the other side. He was gone. You hear me? He was totally gone. That guy was an angel. We have to be careful how we treat those that are less fortunate than we are. He was an angel and he was gone. And he told me forgiveness was for me. Unbelievable. You know, I like to, I guess we can't really know what happened with those guys. You know, if God had an opportunity to touch their hearts, but I, I just think immediately back to the one guy who you looked in his eyes and you said in the name of Jesus, and you said you saw that deliverance happening. And I just, mm -hmm. I just hope in my heart, God worked in that and it wasn't too late for him. And maybe you don't know, maybe he could have witnessed to the other ones before it was over. I don't know. We're not going to be able to know that right now. That's right. Not right now. And and then I felt like, you know, God knows, God knows the future. He knows our hearts. And I, and I knew from what I could see with those other guys, you know, with the, you know, people that hang out like that. I believe that, God turned us over to, it's like a reprobate mind where he knows, look, if you're not going to change, if you're not going to do what I'm, what you're called to do, or God, he puts his hands from around us. 
he opened up the bush, as I say, he just, he just opened up the gate and the enemy comes in and does whatever he wants to do. Because again, here we are in our reprobate mind, we want to do our own thing. And they, they was not going to change. And God knew their hearts. He knew they, they was, their hearts was, was just almost like Pharaoh. It was just, it was just stiff, you know, it just wasn't going to change. And so their destiny was, was cut short because of their, you know, their, their selfishness, you know. So now I know you have, you don't have it behind you, but I know you have a book. So at what point did God lead you to write your story and where can people, can you share the name of that book? Can you share a little bit about how that journey was for you? Oh yeah. In 2005, way before this film thing, in 2005, I, I wrote a book called um, Heaven is Real. And it was about my entire life because I look back from childhood when the devil tried to amputate my left leg back then. You know, I was about, what, 15, 14 years old. And I remember my mom praying over my leg. The doctor said they were going to have to cut the leg off then. It's amazing. Like the enemy was out after my legs, you know. And um, I rem remember my mom praying over my leg. So anyway, I wrote the book coming from that point through my R&B days to how I got delivered and changed my life to God. It's my entire, somewhat my entire life that I wrote uh, in, in that book in um, nice little pictures of family members and stuff like that. But but they can the book is available on, on my website at uh, www.iforgivethemovie.org or, or they can go to Amazon uh, and order their books. All the bookstores, you know, I, it's been out there for, for years now. So it's all over the place. They can, they can find it, but, but it's called Heaven is Real by Tony Davis and in, in, in my um editor Avian Hartwell but mainly but I, uh, the heaven is real by Tony Davis yeah awesome I did not I did not get a chance to read the book I did watch the movie um, and I know you're really passionate about serving others and if you could share a little bit about your foundation and, and what you're doing now yes yes after you know when I said after what happened to me an innocent person just living life you know um Again, never been involved with gangs, never, I can't, again, I, I was a singer, you know, all I did was sing, all of my singing buddies, singing groups, and, you know, I signed with Warner Brothers, you know, in the, in the, in the early 90s, you know, I had a record deal of R&B back then, and, you know, I did a little touring stuff, and the Soul Train, I mean, I did a lot of stuff back in those days, and so I didn't have a lifestyle of violence right it was just the party life and doing crazy stuff until you change right and so yeah. when I finally got to that end where I wasn't raised like this I, I totally changed my life because my mom was in my ear stop singing that stuff and sing for the Lord Tony you know and like mom there's no money in that you know so anyway, that was back in the 90s you know or the, the early 90s thing so in that I I just totally changed my life so I, I never had that type of lifestyle. So my thought was, you know what? Since the devil did that to me, I'm going to change millions of lives. I'm going to bring as many people as I can to Christ to be saved, Lord. Just give me the strength, give me the doors, and I'm going to do it, God. I'm going to do it. As I was I was on fire for the enemy doing all that R&B stuff, I'm going to be on fire for you, God. Just open up them doors, and I promise you I will walk through them. And I'm telling you, God opened up them doors. I went forth, and I, I have a foundation now called the National Increase Peace Foundation, and we go on tour around the country. It started in 2000 in 2003, four. The end of 2004, then five. I did a big event in LA. I was the first one to do this "Stop the Violence" with Tony Davis event, where oh my, it was just magnificent. The mayor, Mayor Villa Ragosa, had got behind me. I had all kinds of special guest speakers. Um, um, A.C. Green of the Lakers, he came out to speak. We had, oh my, it was so awesome. It was at this called Jesse Owens Park where we had like uh, the petting zoo came. We had giveaways. We had 1-800-Dentist uh, came, job fair came. And I even got so bold to, I even had, ordered a helicopter to come to take people on a ride in a helicopter, right? I'm like, we're going to do this big for Jesus, baby. That's what I'm... <laughs> but they said, we couldn't get to permit on time, Tony, not to come in the city like that. <laughs> I'm like, wait, we do it for the world. I'm going to do it for God. And so in that, I have this National Increased Peace Foundation. Here we are years later. 
I've been doing it for years. And I go to her, I was doing speaking engagements where I was calling city mayors across the country myself. And I was, I was like, I would love to come to your city to share my experience, my life. I want to change lives. I want to set the campus free. I want to share my testimony with these young people. So I was going to juvenile hall. I remember here in Downey in California, I would have 500, they would bring in 500 young people, males, and I would share my testimony. And it was so, I was so amazed at the impact that was having on those young people. It, and then they would take them out. They would bring in 500 girls and I would share with them. But, but going back to the guys, I remember this one young kid said, hey, sir, I, I remember that happened to me. He looked like he was about 17, 18, you know, really bad kid, I guess. He did some bad stuff, they said. I, it happened to me, sir. And, you know, uh, and I, I I believe in Jesus. And he said, you just, you just touched my life like never before. And he said, did you see God? And I said, well, you know what? You can't see him, but you can feel his presence. It's almost like wind blowing across your skin. And they were like, oh, man, they, they, they received it so powerfully, you know. And since that time, I've been mentoring ex-gang members. I had one to come to my movie screening here lately. And he shared about how he was going to kill himself. Colonials broke my heart with that. He said he was going to kill himself. He said, but I always picked up for him. But I stood my grounds on foolishness. I'm like, you're not going to keep walking down that road and thinking that I'm going to pray with you and, you know, and you're not changing your life because you're, you're, you're going to turn into a reprobate mind. And you're not going to think that my prayers is going to deliver you from your evilness that you keep doing. So I was kind of stern on some certain things as I deal with certain people, you know, and I'm led to do so. And I said, you're going to change and you're not going to keep doing the foolishness. Either you're going to do it because you, two places you're going to end up, either the, the jail or the grave. Make your choice. Sometimes you got to be stern and not play those look. Oh, I want you to change. It's going to be all right. No, the enemy is crafty and he's seeking everybody that he can devour. So we got to stand firm and say, no, you're not going to live like that. You're not going to be that way. God said you're beautifully, wonderfully made. And you're going to be that beautiful woman that God called you to be. And I, and I believe in speaking those things boldly to these young people so that they can know that you're not going to stand for foolishness. And so anyway, we get that Colonius. I'm so proud of Colonius now. Now he has his own coffee business and seafood business and he's thriving. I'm so proud of him. But he said he was going to kill himself. He said, but you picked up and prayed for me that day, Tony. He called me uh, Pastor Tony. And you picked up and prayed for me. He said, you always picked, you always answered my calls when others wouldn't. And he said, um, I was going to kill myself that day. Mm, he just broke my heart when he said, he said, but, um, he said, but you picked up. And um, I changed my mind. And that meant so much to me. Um, to think about that, you know. It just meant so much that um, just to encourage, you know, someone that it's going to be all right, you know, that um, you keep going, even in your darkness, it's going to work out. You just got to keep trusting God. And I know it gets hard. Yeah. It gets difficult for us all. So that, that that really grabs my heart to think that you can share something with someone and it can actually save their soul. So, um, yeah, sorry, I got a little <laughs> teared out here. But no, just, you're making me I, cry earlier. I had to put you on screen because <laughs> I was like, I don't want to see me crying. That was amazing. Uh, yeah. Absolutely so amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's what I do. We travel and even now, I'm, I'm, I finally got this little small, beautiful team. Uh, even my si my sis uh, Lily is with me now. We, you know, and then we're trying to reach out to keep a tour going. I, I do this thing called a red carpet event where I ship my little five by five piece of red carpet from Hollywood in my backdrops, and we go to these cities and we host a movie screening either at a theater or at a church venue, wherever we can. And um, I, you know, and and, and I'm, again, I don't have large funding so i do it through either ticket sales or we get a sponsor to cover costs you know airfare hotel and all those things and and i take my little team of two or three and we go there and i share the film and i do a 30 minutes q a after the, the uh, film and i mean oh it's so powerful every city is different i've had atheists to come up to me crying saying why did you forgive why i said because jesus forgave me and one lady, she just ran out there screaming. I just prayed for her. She was just, that was in Texas. 
she just she was an atheist. She just couldn't understand why did I why did I forgive? You know, I forgave. It's amazing. I see all kinds of things, you know, but um, it's what God sent me back to do. And I just want to finish my course until I go back home. Amen. Go back home. Amen. Well, you're doing it. You're doing it. And I'm just thrilled to have made contact and share a part of your story. Um, I know you have more movies coming. Isn't that what I understand? Is that possible? Oh, yes. Um, I, I signed a distribution with, with a, a faith-based organization, a faith-based distributor called Bridgestone. They, they're faith-based. Uh, that was a blessing. Uh, they love I Forgive, and this it's on their platform. And as a matter of fact, at this point, we have it's only it's only been on on this um, Encourage TV on YouTube. They have a YouTube channel of Encourage TV for two months, and it has over three hundred thousand views. So it's really getting out there to touch people. And so from that, yeah, we we I'm doing this. Like I said, we doing like I said, we doing this tour thing, you know, to try to promote the film and all those things. Yes. Beautiful. Praise God. Well, I know I want to ask you to pray at the end here, but before we do that, if people want to contact you or have you come speak, where can they reach you? What's the best place? Yes, please go to the website, you know, and contact us. And and um, I, I am the kind of person I'm a hands-on person. I always have been. When I even people see me on these large platforms. Oh, I know it's going to be hard to get to you. No, it's not. I, I am a hand. I love to encourage. That's that's my purpose. That's why God sent me back here. So yes. I love to see people happy. Free, and it's set, the free. best places national. Is it National Increase Peace yes. Foundation yes. Dot com? Okay. <laughs> Just that's wanted. right. Go to the they can go to the uh www uh, national increase peace foundation dot org or or even the, the uh, movie I forgive the movie dot org. Go right there and the, contact me directly through email. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to list those links too. Tony, Pastor Tony, this has been amazing. And I'm so happy that you're still with us. And I think, um, you know, obedience does bring blessings. And I'm just, I, I just, I'm amazed at every piece of your testimony. So if you could just take a moment, and there's so many people that are struggling with forgiveness, um, yeah, yeah. so many people that are that are hoping God's real, but they're just waffling. Like, what can you say to those people? Can you pray over those people for me? Yeah, yes, I sure can. You know, I uh, forgiveness, forgive, give, means to let go, to release. Think about the four. It's something that you're going to step forward to do. Give is when you give it away. So in that, that's just something that I think to myself as I think about that word. So in that, I just want you to sit back and just take a deep breath and think about the greatness of God. Think about the greatness that's in front of you. Stop looking in, in the rearview mirror of what happened. And sometimes we adjust that mirror so we can see even further or continue to see what's behind. Instead of looking at the greatness in front of us where God said, behold, I want to do a new thing in you. So I just want you to just release right now. Just close your eyes and just let me pray with you and just say these words. Father God, please come into my heart. Please come into my mind and my spirit, Jesus. I believe that you died just for me. Make it personal. I believe that you was raised from the dead, Jesus, just for me. The Bible says if you believe that in your heart, you confess that out of your mouth, you're saved. So in that, Father God, I just pray right now for a release. I pray right now that the burden of unforgiveness is lifted from that heart right now. Touch that heavy burden right now. I bind every plot, scheme, and plan of the enemy. I rebuke every contract, every setback, every delay that the enemy has done to your people right now. Oh, God, brush that party away and fill it with your goodness, your mercy, and your love. That's it. I just I just hear chains falling off somebody right now. I just feel a release taking place right now in your life. That's it. Walk into your purpose. I know you've been through some struggles. It, it, it gets weary in your well-doing, but God said, if you faint not, 
he's going to do a great thing because he looks at you as an eagle, people. What does eagles do? Eagles fly over the storm. God wants you to fly over that storm. Stop allowing it to take place and residue in your heart. Stop allowing it to take free rent in your mind. Allow him to just hold you right now. Father God, place, they said, place a blanket of love over that woman of God right now. Man of God, God says, stop looking in your rearview mirror. I know you said you don't understand what they did, but I understand what God will do if you just release it to him. Some of you are saying, well, how can I forgive? You know, you just don't understand. Guess what? They killed me and I forgave. So that same power of forgiveness I just rest it to you today. I give it to you today. I want you to let go and let God stop holding to that thing. Stop allowing the enemy to keep you in that cage and allow God to do mighty, wonderful, great things in your life. So if you release it and let go and let God, everything is going to work out in your favor. So God, I thank you. I bind every backlash and retaliation, what the enemy may do. And I just speak life and I speak it more abundantly. I believe miracles Wonders and signs is going to take place in their lives like never before. And I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 I stand in agreement with every word. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear sis, Julia. It was I wonderful love, being with you today. I love doing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Me too. I love to encourage. I love it. Thank you guys for listening today. Uh, just blessed. Thank you. And if you have a miracle you want to share with me, please reach out to me at Everyday Miracles Podcast uh, at gmail.com. Thank you and God bless. Mm -hmm.